So the reality is that quantum mechanics happens in the real world, right? Where things like laser pointers have to work, uh, clickers have to work. So people seem to think that, oh, it's something very mysterious. But finally, everything has to happen in the real world. We have to measure things in the real world. Uh, so um, let me, since I'm already on this slide, let me uh, start by telling you, if you don't already know about it, that there is this race going on, right? And I've got uh, the, it a little color coded. Um, you have, in the green, you have people working on superconducting qubits. These are a particular kind of technology. Um, in the red, you have people working on ion traps. Uh, it was called Honeywell, now it's called Quantinuum. Um, then you have, uh, in blue, Intel works on spin qubits, Microsoft on topological insulators, and then there is photonics. And then what is hidden out here is a little note that says there are circuits versus annealers. These are all kind of te terminologies that you will hear once you get into this quantum space, right? And uh, we won't, uh, I'm in sort of introducing some of these things. Um, we won't go into too many of the details, but you'll see that, <coughs> oops. Okay. So you'll see that we are in an error that is called the NISC era, the noisy intermediate scale quantum, right? It's NISC. Why is it called NISC? Is because we still don't have the quantum computer. They're still very noisy. We, and uh, we are learning what its capabilities are. But you'll notice something out here on the slide that it's about 400 qubits, right? Which is a very small number for most people who understand classical computing. What are you going to do with 400 qubits? Even your password today is more is using maybe 100 bits or more, right? Uh, 256 bits uh, encryption, right? Uh, D-Wave claims it has 5,000 qubits. So I've introduced many words on this slide. I'm using qubits instead of bits. I'm telling you that 400 is a large number, and 5,000 is supposed to be a larger number, but it is not in the quantum world, right? Because their technology does something different. Continuum, which was Honeywell, was 150. And it is not quite as large as 400, but it might be better than 5,000 and so on. It's a little confusing for people who are in this game. The other thing that uh, is interesting is that these things work at very low temperatures, 20 millikelvin. So it's really, really cold. Kelvin is where zero Kelvin is absolute zero. You cannot get any colder than that. This is 0.002 Kelvin, right? It's as cold as that. And it needs to be that cold because any noise affects your quantum system. So when Sudarshan uh, said that this is about engineering, I believe it is 100% the job of the engineers. That is why I keep talking to engineers, entrepreneurs, and I'm here today saying that this is not going to be built by physicists in their labs. This is going to be built by people in our communities of engineering and businessmen who understand how to take some, a lab experiment and take it to product. Uh, what you see out here is what is called the dilution refrigerator that takes it from room temperature down to this 20 millikelvin temperature out here, right? Uh, not all super com uh, quantum computers are built like this. As I said, uh, there are other technologies, the ion traps and the photonics and the uh, semiconductor ones, but we are not going to, their, their pictures are not so pretty, so we don't put them up, right? Uh, Rigetti is interesting. The CEO of Rigetti is an Indian. Uh, he's an alumnus of IIT Bombay. I had a long chat with him, right? And uh, they're competing with the big boys. So this is a classic case of entrepreneurs competing with the big boys. They don't have the deep pockets. They don't have all everything, but they sit on a large set of patents that are of value to both Google and IBM, right? So there's opportunity out there for each and every one of us. Uh, why does quantum computing work? Um, it works for, for two reasons. One reason is that waves interfere. So if you look at this particular picture, what I'm showing you is that if you have what are called qubits, and you have 64 qubits, you suddenly have 10 to the power 19 computational paths. So think of this picture where I have two stones in my pond, and all the waves are interfering. Similarly, if I increase the number of pond, uh, waves, uh, stones in my pond, I will have all the waves interfering with each other. And if you do that math, and each qubit is actually a wave, 
then the number of computational parts you'll end up with scales very dramatically until you have 10 to the power 19 of them. Right? That's a dramatic improvement. Why don't we see it today? Because the numbers I gave you previously were you know, in the hundreds is because they are noisy. This assumes that everything is talking to everything else and they're noise free. That is not the case. Right? So our challenge is to actually make it happen. Uh, and you understand it mathematically in something uh, of this form, right? So you have little different algebra. I won't bore you with the algebra, but we talk in terms of superposition and we talk in terms of kets. This is where, you know, the physicists come up with. This is called a ket because it's half a bracket. So the other half of this is a bra and this is a ket, so that together they become a bracket, right? Let me uh, <coughs> ask you this. When do we use quantum computers? I'm afraid uh, this is covering part of my slides, but uh, the, when do we use a quantum computer? We don't always use a quantum computer. By and large, a, a classical computing will scale like this, and quantum computing will see some kind of a crossover point where it will start doing better than classical computing. And there are two algorithms that people focus on. One is called Grover Search, and one is called Shores Factoring, right? So one has to be aware that when the size of the problem increases is where we'll start using quantum computers. And right now what we do is what we call hybrid computing, which is we basically use a quantum circuit in the middle of a loop that does a classical compute, right? So hybrid quantum computing is what you will see in the near term. Uh, and we talk about unique Hardware. So there are two hardware systems. One is circuit-based systems, one are annealers. Uh, circuit-based systems uses another trick of quantum mechanics called entanglement, which is uh, what Einstein used to call spooky action at a distance. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about these concepts, please reach out to us. Um, this, that's not the topic of this talk, but you'll understand that wave-based computing can be done with annealers and circuit. And if you're trying to do it as gate-based computing, then you uh, use... Uh, sort of superconducting qubits, right? <coughs> okay. And I'm introducing this. I promised the panelists that I will introduce some of this stuff to the audience during my keynote. Uh, so you are familiar with some of the language. You will see that there are many different types of uh, computers that are being built. Uh, you will hear both about photonic qubits as well as uh, solid state approaches. Um, but we, there are others called trapped ions and uh, NMR, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance and topological qubits. The problem is that if you look at the scalability, many of them are quite low. The photonic qubits have very high scalability. Others are still struggling in terms of scalability. Uh, the qubit lifetimes are a different problem. What is called gate fidelity is a problem. Gate fidelity means if I say two plus two, and the quantum computer says, ah, maybe it is 3.8. And I'll be like, excuse me, everybody knows it's 4, right? But that is the problem with the quantum computers, right? Uh, <coughs> so why do we look at it? We look at it because of charts like this, where there are the bystanders, there are the beginners, there are the learners, the professionals, uh, and the legends, right? We are somewhere out here in the middle where we are close to seeing the inflection. We are seeing sense that this is really going to start taking off. We want to be a player in this game. And we are seeing applications that come in automotive and assembly. Uh, um, Volkswagen has done a very nice demonstration using quantum computers. We see uh, chemicals uh, taking off. We see pharmaceuticals and medical products. Uh, the first, to my knowledge, the first private investment of purchase of a quantum computer for close to $150 million was the Cleveland Clinic, which is interested in pharmaceuticals and medical products, right? So people are putting down that kind of money now to buy these things. Uh, NVIDIA, which was mentioned earlier, which does only quantum simulations, uh, actually tied up to do a, a simulation of a, a Rolls-Royce engine, right, uh, along with Boeing. So. Uh, People are trying to simulate quantum systems and get advantage in the aerospace and defense systems. And of course, financial services, I know for a fact that a hedge fund made 10% more profits by doing what is known as quantum portfolio optimization instead of doing classical portfolio optimization. 
right? Uh, that's a separate story. But of course, they're not going to tell it to us publicly because then everybody will do it and then they don't make their 10% profit, right? So there are some of those games being played. Uh, so this is where we are, window of opportunity. We have optimization, combinatorial logistics, and quantum machine learning. These are all opportunities that I play with along with startups. I play with people like IBM, and I also uh, play in these areas as academic, right? Uh, but you can see that we are hoping that it will move even further. And this is the problem, right? This is actually the holy grail that started us off on this race to say that a quantum computer is going to break RSA encryption. When that does, it means all our transactions that are done on the internet today are insecure. Right? Now, there are naysayers to this argument. There are also people like me who will sell fear, who will say that this is the reason that you need a quantum computer. But even if you don't believe this, there are enough applications to understand that we do want to uh, invest in quantum computing. Right? Um, the type of problems you look at, NP hard problems, uh, there's bin packing. So one of the problems that we look at is how do you load uh, containers onto a port, uh, onto a ship, or how do you order the ships to come onto the port? These are logistic problems that require optimization, bin packing, and then there's route optimization, Zomato, DHL, all of them, aircraft routing. There's image classification problems for medical images, we use that. By and large, you can also think of any machine learning problem that will benefit from uh, using quantum machine learning when you have large feature sets. Uh, we have had conversations, for example, with the uh, uh, direct benefit transfers uh, in Tamil Nadu to see if uh, we can use some of these ideas there. And then at a very fundamental level, if you start talking about proteins or chemicals or physical systems, you need simulations that are quantum mechanics. right? So all of these are applications that are ripe for investment and for a large set of people start looking at them. Right? Uh, the technology landscape, as you'll see, is very much China and US driven. India needs to come up on this. And if you look at the number of quantum computing patents, the US leads that, but China is catching up. And this is already five years old data. Right? Uh, and this is what is happening, right? So you can see that people are building photonic quantum computers and they look like this. And we don't really want to build something like this. We want to build something that is scalable, something that is easier to assemble. And uh, I mean, I showed you pictures of the superconducting qubits and now I'm showing you pictures of the photonic things. These are scary looking machines. But if you think back on the world's first computers and the world's first hard drives, they were the size of this room. Right? So it's no reason to be scared. Right? We are good at taking this and bringing it, making it smaller, making it scalable, and finally putting it into our phones. Right? That's a long journey. This is the start of the journey. Right? So it's an exciting time to be a part of this journey, and that is what, what has brought us to, uh, together out here. So there's a whole zoo that one has to uh, look at. You have atoms, you have superconductors, you have semiconductors. It's a lot of opportunity for anybody who wants to do anything, whether it is cryogenics or control systems. There's a lot of opportunity, and I would encourage people to jump into the bandwagon earlier than later, right? And that's what the panel discussion is going to do, right? So I'm going to ask, uh, sort of wrap it up very quickly with, uh, by addressing this last part, which is when will you first see quantum tech working at scale? Right? That's, a, that's the question that we want to really answer. And uh, this is what is required. Right? This was a driving force to say that if I had quantum supremacy, which, which is about 10 to the power 4 or 10 to the power 5 qubits, remember, where are we today? We are at about 400, 500. So we are a factor of 10 off. I expect that we will hit this in the next couple of years. You will start seeing all the near-term applications as soon as you hit 10,000. And you will start seeing useful error-corrected quantum computing in this particular box when you hit about a million qubits, right? When this happens, we are definitely in trouble because our data is not secure 
and when will we know it is insecure? We will not know until people have finished stealing our data, right? So if you look at IBM's quantum computing roadmap, they are saying that by 2023, which is this year, they're going to give us 1,000 qubits, right? And I believe it because so far they've hit the 2022 target. And this processor is already in the making, and by end of this year, they're going to release this processor. So you're going to have 1,000 qubits, right? And if you have something like that, then all of these things become less secure. You'll see that 256-bit AES uh, uh, becomes a 128-bit AES. A lot of these are get broken, right? And you have to now look at the opportunity in quantum communications and say, okay, or post-quantum cryptography and say, can we change all our uh, ways of doing digital transactions? So there's a huge opportunity there for industry again. Right, to go in and say, okay, we can change cryptographic systems, do post-quantum cryptography. We can build quantum communication links. Let me show you what a quantum uh, communication link looks like. Uh, this is the inflection point. So Shor's algorithm gets used to break your passwords. And so what China has gone ahead and done is it's built a quantum communication link from Beijing to Shanghai. Imagine that, right? So they have gone ahead and done this. They have put up satellites that will communicate across their different cities. They have got networks on each of their main uh, cities along this link. Right? Beijing 1. Beijing 1. Beijing 1. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, uh, the satellite systems also talk along uh, with the terrestrial systems. So we have an opportunity to do both of these things. Uh, as Sudarshan mentioned, we have already done an equivalent of this in Chennai, and now the National Quantum Mission will hopefully allow us to do something like this. Um, <coughs> we built what is called Makan, Metro Area Quantum Access Networks in Chennai, and the plan is to build them at Bangalore, Hyderabad, Bhopal, and Delhi. And then we take it from Chennai to Bangalore, and then from Bangalore all the way to Delhi. Right? So this sort of is again a big opportunity that we are seeing for people to step in and say, okay, you know, how are we going to safeguard our backbone, right? Uh, and of course, this is the only the starting dream. Otherwise, you'll have this connected all across the country, right? Um, <coughs> I think I have to turn this way. All right. <laughs> Uh, so this is what is called the Metro Area Quantum Access Network, right? So the Metro Area Quantum Access Network runs between IIT Madras, IIT Madras Research Park, Society for Electronic Transaction Security, and then it connects to the National Informatics Network. So that connects then to the backbone, right? So you need Makan, which is Metro Area Quantum Access Network, and then you need Kila, which is the fort, right? So you need your house, you need your fort, and the fort is the backbone that goes right across the country. So these are sort of the opportunities that we think will be there. And uh, a lot of it is being funded today, even before um, uh, the National Quantum Mission has kicked off. You'll see that we started as early as 2005, and we took a long break because the quantum computer was not coming. But when the quantum computer started coming up, then there has been an investment that sort of allows people to um, um, grow some of these things. Uh, the amount of money that is required is fairly large. But I think that sort of money is being promised by the different uh, funding agencies, right? So um, this is also my acknowledgement slide. So I will uh, perhaps stop here. Uh, maybe one more acknowledgement uh, for uh, to all the people who are helping me. Uh, there are just a few photographs that I've put in here. But actually, if you look at it, there are three different verticals. And there are all kinds of people who get involved. Physics, electrical engineering, biotechnology, chemistry, metallurgy, mechanical engineering, management studies. If you look at the amount of work that is involved, it is not going to happen by one academic. It's not going to happen by one academic and his or her students. It's not going to happen by IIT Madras, CDAC, SETS, ERNET. No. It's going to happen because all of us come together to take this national mission forward. The national mission has enough work for everybody uh, if we step in. Right, so uh, with that, let me stop here and um, take questions. So yeah, uh, hi everyone. I think, uh, yeah, 
So uh, my name is uh, Manjunath. So I'm a VP of Quantum Hardware and Research at Cupi AI India Private Limited. So we are uh, we are a startup. We are focused on we are AI and quantum enterprise level solutions provider. Uh, so we we focus on building full stack AI, quantum computing uh, system uh, with also capability of in, uh, having the AI aspects also in this. And we work with a lot of customers uh, building both at the from the from the software level, the algorithms, and also uh, the hardware aspects. So I have my slide here. So our, our motto is to integrate AI and quantum vertically. So what does that mean? So basically. So uh, for large complex computational problem as uh, Professor Anil had, uh, yeah, uh, Professor Anil had uh, mentioned in uh, logistics, uh, financial services, drug discovery. So uh, we build algorithms for these kind of problem statement. Our quantum software team uh, works with uh, building the stack that can be run on current and also the next generation of quantum. And our motto is to build a quantum computing as a service uh, model. Uh, our team, uh, yeah, so we have about uh, 40 plus strong engineering team. This is built across our AI uh, team and also our quantum team. And uh, we have more than 10 patents filed uh, in, the, in this aspect. And we have more than 13 PhDs working on all the, all the uh, full stack solution in the algorithm software development, quantum processor development, and control hardware. So as I mentioned, the AI aspect is what uh, we deal with enterprises. So we solve the uh, uh, problem statement in enterprises using our uh, auto ML and ML ops platform. So this is a NASCOM award winning uh, platform. And uh, this supports more than 200 plus or 300 plus models in it. So it's a low code, no code platform, uh, which, uh, which can be uh, used for AI model discovery and deployment. And we use the same platform to integrate our quantum solutions. Uh, with respect to, yeah, uh, as you know, like the, uh, the power of quantum computation that you start with the, uh, the exponential space that you can see with the qubits, and then you have a superposition uh, system, and then you interconnect the qubits to get entangled in this. And how do you do it on hardware? There are two forms. One is a superconducting qubit, semiconducting photonic. We work on these superconducting based system. Uh, how we work uh, with, uh, with our enterprise uh, customers, namely how we integrate quantum solutions to the enterprises is that uh, any business case uh, in their domain uh, is being mapped into our uh, software stack, which is uh, QPI Pro, QPI Opt, uh, simulation and ML. So these are specific aspects of optimization problem, machine learning and drug discovery simulation. And these can be run with the current generation classical hardware, that is your uh, GPUs, ASICs, and when the quantum computer come, it get accelerated. So uh, with all our customers, we, this is the uh, stack that we have built, and uh, we also help them to adopt quantum in their uh, enterprises. And why we start with this optimization is that it's a quantum-inspired uh, libraries uh, that can run on the classical system, and then uh, with the quantum system, it can be much more faster. And with respect to the full stack uh, quantum computing hardware, so uh, we first, as I mentioned, the software libraries, then we have our control electronics, which uh, needs to have, a, uh, uh, as uh, the quantum computing system doesn't work on uh, classical bits, uh, and uh, it's not a digital system, it's a purely analog and RF system. Uh, so there, there needs to be this control electronics that, uh, that uh, controls and reads out the states of the qubits. And we work on these uh, uh, superconducting qubits based quantum processor. Uh, we work on both uh, aspects on the NISC hardware and also provide uh, IPs for fault tolerant uh, qubits. And uh, yeah, th this is the aspect of a full stack quantum computer. So you start with your algorithms and libraries, which is on certain domains in optimization, machine learning, and simulation. And then we have our own quantum circuit compiler that compiles to the specific hardware architecture of the quantum processors. And with respect to the control system, we have two uh, way ways which we are doing. We have our own control hardware and also working on cryogenic uh, CMOS controllers because uh, superconducting and semiconducting qubit system work at uh, cryogenic temperatures like 10 millikelvin is where the quantum processor sits, but at 4 Kelvin you have the cryogenic system and at the room temperature you have the control hardware. So this is how uh, the full stack solution is there and then how we provide uh, the quantum access through the cloud. And uh, 
these are the uh, li uh, uh, libraries or the software solutions that uh, we have already built and we have already implemented in certain uh, uh, different uh, industries in logistics, uh, financial services, and also energy and materials uh, and pharma industry. Uh, and these are the use cases uh, with different uh, companies that we are doing. We have done route optimization, uh, supply chain, uh, machine uh, uh, default prediction in banks, and also the portfolio optimization and material discovery. So as I mentioned that uh, the enterprises want to adopt these uh, quantum solutions, but we start off with uh, the inspired libraries and then we move to the quantum, uh, uh, the quantum libraries. And I can show you some of the results uh, or, or the customers which we work with, uh, ZF Group, uh, LLED is a pharma company, uh, Siemens, uh, American Express, and also a lot of Japanese companies. Uh, what uh, results that we have achieved, right? So with respect to this pan-European vehicle route optimization, so we were able to uh, reduce the cost uh, up to 40% in the, this one, and also uh, the total time taken for the vehicles. So this is about like 400 cities across Europe, and uh, it uh, and for real time uh, implementation of pickup and delivery optimization yeah so th some of the use cases also with respect to quantum machine learning uh, which we work with the banks to show that how uh, quantum xc boost can give much higher uh, speed up when compared to classical algorithms and also in the network design uh, then when we come to our uh, quantum circuit compiler, as I mentioned, you need uh, some circuits, which is a gate-based quantum computer, uh, which can run uh, on the hardware system or qubit system. And we uh, develop these to map the quantum algorithms to the, this one. So in this way, you provide both the circuit compiler and software libraries uh, to our end-to-end -end customers. Yeah. One more. And uh, yeah, with respect to the hardware, yes. Uh, uh, these are our control uh, hardware system. and. Uh, Finally, just going as aspect with respect to the quantum computing system across the world, right? So many of these are with large companies like IBM and also in China and also Rigetti in US. But at the Indian uh, ecosystem, we don't have such a system. And uh, we as a provider are first working on our uh, uh, 25 qubit and uh, 50 qubit quantum uh, uh, computing system, integrating all these software stack. And what we work towards is a scalable uh, quantum computing system that is all the way to 300 qubits with a single. So that is our goal uh, with respect to building a full stack solution at QPI AI. And uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, if you have some questions. Hi everyone, I'm Animesh. Uh, I'm CEO, founder of uh, Thackbit Lab. We are basically a quantum technology company and our focus currently is on quantum safe communication, something which uh, Ayn was talking about, you know, what we, how to secure your data in a safe form and all. Something very interesting about superposition is <laughs> is where you are. So Bangalore, Bangalore actually is a very unique place. A lot of things about quantum communication actually started from here, from ISC in the year 1984, when the first protocol was being discussed. And if you look at what is the state uh, tagline, is Karnataka is one state, many worlds. So this is something very <laughs> similar to what you know we have in uh, physics, quantum physics, which is like parallel worlds exist and how we you know uh, exploit it. So superposition is something. So yeah, this is uh, what it is. Now, I feel um, as far as we look at data security, uh, we need to be very uh, you know updated about what's happening outside. Most of the times, people who are working in the cybersecurity, they don't understand or probably they are not privy to what is happening in the computation space, right? So a lot of developments have actually happened, and that actually possesses a risk. One of the faulty things which we do is that when we do not have the right way to estimate those risks, right? And, well, there are debates about when can quantum come in, a large-scale quantum computer would come in. Is it? Okay. No, but I can actually probably do it, I think. Yeah. So... Um, one of the, uh, like, how do you find whether your data is safe in a post quantum world? So there is something very unique about an e inequality which was probably discussed uh, around six, seven years ago, which is called as Mosca in inequality. I have also emailed them, actually. Yeah, so it's like, what is the shelf life of your data? And, you know, and what, what, what is the time it takes you to transition to a newer technology, which is, let's say, if X plus Y is greater than Z, and Z is basically the time to realize a large-scale quantum computer. So if your uh, shelf life of your data is plus the transition time, 
is more than uh, the time it takes to build a large-scale quantum computer, then you are at risk. And for that, you will have to find out ways to uh, you know, and, uh, you know, ensure that your data is safe in a post-quantum world. And when I say, is it relevant for every data that, that we have today? Not really. We have to worry about what data is relevant and what has to be safeguarded for the next you know, five plus years, because that's a time probably you know, when a lot, lot of computers will start kicking in. So you need to adapt to those methods now and how you can do it is you can you know there are multiple solutions so the world is going to be qkd plus P, you know post quantum uh, cryptography and what we have to do is that we have to start looking at what are the endpoints that we want to secure and this is going to be relevant for a b2b and a b2g space and we have been able to develop and deliver this for government agencies now what we look at how do how we can ensure that quantum systems are there to safeguard your data this is relevant for you know healthcare this is relevant for data centers, for telecommunication companies, whatever the bulk of the data is lying, right? And when you look at the fiber network, I mean, the entire world is now connected with terrestrial networks, and other countries are already, you know, way, like as he mentioned, are ahead in terms of their deployment. We have to find out a way to collaborate and have those, uh, you know, the, as he, uh, Anil was mentioning about networks being built and, you know, upgrade them to quantum safe networks. And this can be done by, you know, you know, collaboration with academics, collaboration, because it's not a single man's job who can do this. In fact, it has, you know, it, it has also taken China to have a 10, 20 year planning, and that's where they are. So uh, we have to look at how do we ensure uh, that we do some couple of POCs, we un understand how to take this technology forward, because only adaption can lead you to reduce the total cost of ownership of the system. So I heard someone talk about, you know, what is the cost risk benefit? Well, you have to worry about your data. If your data is not sensitive, don't worry about it. But if you want to safeguard something, it could be a healthcare data. Geographies are coming up with securing your data for the next uh, you know, 50, 60 years. How are you going to do that if you do not have a method which will survive those uh, you know, uh, uh, developments, right? So it is very crucial that we understand our data. We've got a slide up, but let's do it. Very yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I'll, OK, this works. <laughs> this is, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, put it next. Yeah, yeah, so just one second. If you do that first, I can't help. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Go before. Yeah, before, before. Yeah. This is something which I was talking about in terms of superposition, so. So four things already, you know, Anil has talked about in computing, sensing, memory, and safe communication. We are focused on sa quantum safe communication. Next slide, please. Uh, yes. So if you see, uh, you see, you know, how someone is trying to assess the risk, and what uh, this is a poor method. What happens, you know, is a leak, and then you will try to, you know, proof it, right? Uh, what is relevant here? Yes. Next slide, please. This is what is the fiber world without quantum computers. of quantum uh, computing, a lot of things actually will get uh, you know, uh, multiplied, and you will see a lot of attacks actually on, on the data that we have today. Right? Next slide, please. So we should start. Yeah. So any data that is already at a five plus years of confidentiality is at risk. And it's getting harvested for it to be decrypted later when the technology is mature. So we have quantum safe encryption in place, you are for a you know, catastrophe. So this okay. is not, this is, <laughs> I, it's done, sorry. Yes, <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, this All is, right. really, really. yeah, sure. Let sure, them. sure. Yeah. 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 Because you are going second, third, fourth year because everybody has the same slides. So I don't really need to tell anyone what quantum computing is. Uh, I do need to tell everyone that I'm an engineer for a change. Uh, and like Anil was mentioning some time back, we believe that uh, quantum computing is now ripe for engineering to take over, optimize it, and build hardware. So what do we do? We build a, a photonic error-corrected universal quantum computer. So this is not an annealer. It's a universal quantum computer. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this uh, because we've seen all these approaches before. So. The gist of this is that there are many, many approaches to building a quantum computer. 
and we really don't know which one is going to work. Uh, difficulties of scaling are the major problem to look at. When you're seeing these numbers, right, 433, uh, which is the highest number on the slide, but uh, do those 433 qubits realize even one usable qubit? Uh, the answer today is probably no. So you probably need uh, thousands of them to realize one. So you need that kind of scale. So you need the million qubit error. And uh, people like Photonics and Silicon Spin are promising to get there. And once they get there, the software guys are going to be really happy because uh, it's going to be more predictable. Uh, so why do we do uh, photonics? Uh, see, photonics is a, is a technology that we use every day, right? All this communication which is happening is happening using photonics. So we are using the same telecom technology. So at least technology-wise, those parts are proven. What we need to do is just prove the quantum part, right? Make it quantum, keep it quantum. The most difficult parts are make it quantum, keep it quantum for us. And that's what we do day and night. That's what we struggle to achieve. But uh, once we do that, uh, the rest of the technology is there. It's cheaper. There's a lot of R&D happening there, which has already happened for all these major communication networks that we have built. So we believe that that is the way to go. Uh, very, very quickly, uh, what are the different approaches? Right? And I'm not going to go into the details of this. The slide has got messed up. You know, problems with PPTs always. Uh, but look on the extreme left, right? Two main approaches, okay? One approach is called the discrete variable approach uh, at the bottom. And what this does is it uses the quantum properties of single photons. Fairly simple to understand. Take a single photon, use some property of it, and that is your quantum state. You manipulate it, you have a qubit, you build a computer based on that. So are there problems? Uh, yes, it's a single photon. What if you lose the photon? You've lost the information, right? So it's very, very difficult to control. It's very difficult to keep the photon there, keep it in its quantum state, et cetera. Uh, but there are very, very highly funded companies who are going this route, right? Uh, PsyQuantum is an example of a company who's raised a billion dollars, right? And they say that they'll give you a million qubits soon. Uh, let's hope that they do. Uh, that, yeah, they say 2025. Uh, <laughs> I think they've started taking that date off, but uh, <laughs> if they do, it's good for all of yeah. us, right? Because we have a quantum computer, it's bad for the encryption guys. Uh, what we do is the approach at the top, and uh, this is a slightly different approach. Right? You say that you know single photons have these problems, so why not use a bunch of photons? Right? So okay, let's use a bunch of photons, but is a bunch of photons a quantum state? No, right? I mean, you have to go down to the quantum level. Well, it just so happens that you can take the electric field of this bunch of photons and do funny things around it, and that behaves like a quantum object. So that's, that's what we do. So we take a bunch of photons, electric field, put it in superposition, and go ahead and use that. There are problems with this. Generating this is not straight, straightforward. <coughs> there are volumes written on how to do it, and it's probably an engineering problem to get it into mass production. But this is basically what we are doing. It's uh, being done in our laboratory in Bangalore. We are a completely Indian company. Uh, it's just a bit slow, that's all. Uh, I'm not going to go through each and every person on this list, but uh, it's basically a bunch of engineers. We have uh, software and algorithm people. We have physicists. We have Anil. Uh, so it's a, it's a team which is comprised of Everything which is needed to build a full stack quantum computer, you can get in touch with me. I can share the team, the details, and exactly what we are doing. Uh, I'm also going to skip our partners. Uh, <laughs> because Anil is giving me the stairs. <laughs> but uh, this is basically a list of other people who are trying to do something similar. Right? And you can see that uh, there are companies uh, who are doing this, and there is belief that it can be done. They are all well-funded companies. They are all across the globe. Uh, none of them have done it yet. Uh, I mean, everybody is dipping their feet in. It's a race, and let's see how that goes.
Thanks, Ruth. Uh, can we can we move to the panel discussion now, Ruth? Uh, just to re reiterate what the four companies are, we have two companies building hardware. One with superconducting qubits, one with photonics. We have one co company building hardware for quantum communications, and we have Ruth who does the quantum simulations. So we've covered actually a fair broad spectrum out here, and I re request the panelists to come on stage. Uh, we'll start by asking Animesh to uh, answer, uh, answer the w one question that the audience had, um, which was, should we really be investing money in this? And as startups, I'm hoping <laughs> I know your answer, but yeah. I think the justification is required, right? Given all the priorities, just try it, might be open. Hello. Yeah, yeah. please, please. I so how do you justify use the use of fund taxpayer funds or investor funds uh, on building something like this where the returns are unclear according to uh, you? Yeah. No, so as I mentioned that we are looking at sensitive data at this point of time. So you have to look at what are the, what is the data that is going to be meaningful for government agencies, for defense, for banks. So we are looking at securing that data. It is not, as I mentioned, if you do not, so if your data is not going to be meaningful tomorrow, you don't have to worry about it. 
but when but that is not the case there there are agencies there are institutions which require a higher confidentiality time and that's where you have to invest because the quantum of loss if if things are which is getting harvested today and when are, they are decrypted later is something which will be something you can't imagine so you have to start making sure your data is quantum safe uh, for for the, whatever the critical data you're holding today i hope Thank that answer sorry go ahead I was here in BIC uh, a month or two back where Synergia Foundation, he gave a talk on this future proofing our data, right? And there are two companies in India who are working on it. But a question from the audience was that how do you, how can you future proof something which you, when you don't have, in, uh, where, where the threat itself is not clear or the technology which will enable that threat has not been developed? So it's like you're building a protection system before the, uh, the, the threat system has been developed. Yeah, some of this I had actually captured in my slide, but then I'll answer this. Uh, see, you have to understand what is the foundation of your security, what you're using today. So RSA, as you know, he, uh, Anil mentioned about, is based on how hard it is to crack a key, okay? Whereas if you look at what is being uh, you know, given by quantum is not because of mathematical hardness. Okay, it, there will be no impact of computing, no advancement in either classical computing or quantum computing can challenge the, uh, you know, uh, the uh, security of quantum safe communication. Okay, so we have two problems majorly. One is that your algorithms are not designed for, they were not designed for quantum computers. Second, you do not have a way to stop data harvest. So even if you say that, okay, you know, I don't have to worry, it is going to take some time when the quantum computers come, but what is happening to your data today? It's getting harvested in real time without your knowledge, and you have no clue what is happening today, right? So we are addressing these two problems. Um, let me add uh, a very specific use case that came to our attention. There was a large multinational company that ran operations uh, offshore and uh, what they found was that their control room was uh, some distance away from where their uh, machinery was. And they were afraid that their control signals were being tapped so that people could learn about the machinery. Right? And something like that is happening today. And we do not know what the consequences of not safeguarding that is. So even if they encrypt that today, Maybe in five years or 10 years, they've lost it. And that is a very big thing. You can imagine that some of this machinery lasts for like 50 years. It could be a nuclear power plant for all you know, right? And this is really something that is very dangerous if we are not able to safeguard it. So uh, what he did not say or did not use the words were information theoretic security. With pen and paper, they will prove to you that it cannot be decrypted, even on a quantum computer. Right? So it's information theoretic security. It is not security because I have a bigger, smaller computer and tomorrow you'll have a bigger. That is not the kind of security that they're providing through quantum communications. They're trying to provide information theoretic security. And mathematically, you can prove that it is perfectly secure. Right? If you look at RSA, for example, right? In 1977, the promise was that it will not be broken for the next 10,000 years. It was broken in less than 17 years. So now what you have done is that you have made it more difficult. So you, to, today you use RSA 2048. So it is actually a life, you know, it is eternity if you're only having regular computers. Okay. Well, maybe I'll ask a question to the, our quantum computing specialists. So the way I perceive this is that the quantum computers are the tip of the sphere and he's providing the shield, right? He's trying to safeguard, whereas your job is to break it, right? <laughs> uh, do you see challenges based on the conversation we just had that, you know, this is not going to happen in any near time future. So do you see challenges from a business standpoint on why do you think people should invest in your particular efforts? Uh, okay. Uh, I think uh, with every technology, people say it's not going to happen, right? Until one fine morning, chat GPT happens. So I think there will always be naysayers and there are always many, many, many challenges to building technology. But uh, if you see the pace of development recently, and if you see how many people are trying, right? Given so many very smart people are trying to do this, it is going to happen, right? And the shield has to be there now, like you said, because 
people are just storing all this communication. You can decrypt something which is stored. So as soon as a quantum computer comes in, and that's where the geopolitics also plays in, right? Countries are not going to give quantum computers to other countries because you know you want to listen to other countries' communication. You don't want to give them the much, uh, the means to listen to yours, because every country is storing everybody else's communication. It's happening over the airwaves. It's just that you can't listen to it today. You'll listen to it five years down the line, and that's good enough. So it is going to happen. Question of now, five years down the line, or ten years down the line, but it's not going to be ten thousand years. Yeah. That's it's actually a very good uh, place for me to uh, ask uh, both Ruth as well as uh, Manjunath. Uh, a lot of the leads in superconducting qubit technology are from the West, right? Uh, if, um, I mean, there is the Finnish effort, there's a US effort, um, there's a Japanese effort actually, so they're East, so it's not all the West. Uh, many people may not be aware that the superconducting qubits were actually invented in Japan and the um, the businesses have taken it up uh, fr uh, from Europe and uh, America. Um, Ruth is actually based in the US, um, and uh, you are here. How do you see this geopolitics between the West and India, and now with Russia also you know, playing truant? How do you see this all playing out in your particular domains? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, I think. Um, uh, with respect to this, right? So uh, mainly the focus was on the manufacturing, developing the manufacturing process. And that is concentrated in the US, Europe, and this one. Uh, and if you see, uh, maybe in the future, like uh, it, if it become as a national security thing, then uh, it might be a technology denial for us. So it it is good to have that R&D and all the things uh, be ready for that that aspect. So I would say that uh, this R&D for the superconducting based system uh, initially would go with the NISC era, and then we go to the fault tolerant. There could be even much uh, improvements in the uh, superconducting qubits where even a single Josephson or a, a single qubit can become an error corrected qubit. So there, there can be s such things. And then uh, if you are not there in that step, maybe uh, we would again miss the bus. So I, I would say that it, it we have to be competitive with the West uh, to show that we are capable on making this, we can uh, we can do this. Uh, whether it can be a cryogenic system, even even designing quantum processor, we build that capability so that we always don't depend on uh, this. So that is my point. Yeah. Ruth, would you like to comment on this? Yeah. So we actually have not readily seen any issues be, uh, playing with regards to the geopolitics that are currently ongoing. And even in the future, I do not think the, the applications that we're focusing on, we've actually made sure that we're not necessarily focusing too much on the defense or the security point of view, so as to kind of not necessarily get involved in this. However, having said this, I do remember a particular instance where one of the applications, um, there was an organization based out of Europe, but uh, we being an Indian based organization at the time, we actually were not able to do a project with them because of the, the ties that India has with other nations and such. Right. And so there are real issues that do pose, however, if let's say we are focusing on either organizations that are not that have very little to do with defense or security then we don't necessarily see that much of an issue because we have partnered with companies in japan uh, many companies in europe and us actually as well as few companies out of india as well so we have not necessarily seen too much of an issue personally well that's good to hear uh, do the audience have any other questions yeah please Um, so IBM had uh, made uh, you know uh, quantum computing ability open to public through its cloud services. Uh, so is there similar effort? I think uh, something closer to that would be the government's network. It has a government is also trying to throw open Param supercomputer uh, computing ability to the public through collaboration with NASCOM. So similarly, you know, uh, is there anything uh, that's being done? Uh, for a, from a government level or people like you yourself uh, who have built uh, you know 25 qubit super com uh, quantum computers i mean make make it available uh, to public is there any effort there i 
can try to take that particular question because I also represent the government. Um, <coughs> let me clarify two things, right? Mm -hmm. First of all, startups cannot give away th anything for free. I mean, they will not survive otherwise. Right? So it's unfair to ask him to give away his 25 qubit when it is ready yeah. for free. I think it will be a pay as you use service. Yeah. If I may use yeah. your words. Yes. Um, the IBM has also not given anything for free. On the cloud, they give you five qubits, seven qubits, which are not really useful for very much. Um, we at IIT Madras today have access to 433 qubits, but we pay for it. And we pay quite a bit for it. Right? So um, uh, this is not a place where there is anything free happening. Even uh, Amazon Bracket uh, is getting funded by the government to provide it to other people. So there are different schemes where people are exploring um, how do you get give out, give out access or provide access? I'm not say, going to say give, provide access. And most of them are involved with some amount of payment, uh, big or small, depending on you know what the MOUs are. Um, but as far as I know, only the so, um, simulators are free. Right? Um, and five qubits, seven qubits, you can do it on hardware, but you can also do it on a simulator. You don't really need hardware for that. Um, so I think there is still some journey out there, and uh, there are investments required before um, we will be able to see this move to scale, where someone might be able to say, "Yeah, it's okay. I can, you know, provide broader access to everybody." Otherwise, it's either going to be a collective uh, investment from uh, people, or it is going to be taxpayers who are going to fund this, which is what has happened, I think, in all countries. Taxpayers have funded it in a large part. Yeah. So to add on to what Anil mentioned. Uh, Ruth, you wanted to say something? Can you guys hear me? Uh, yeah. To add on to what Anil mentioned, um, these companies, right, what Anil mentioned is 100% correct that somebody has to pay, right? Uh, nothing is given out for free. However, many of these companies are providing uh, startups opportunities to partner with them. And then, and thus provide them access to those larger systems. For example, IBM, we are the first Indian based uh, quantum computing company, which actually got into their uh, quantum network, which gives us that availability of the large systems. Along with that, they've provided us with credits as well. And likewise, we are partnered with AWS, Azure, and other providers who have supported us. And so startups definitely can, you know, leverage this, but for individuals, I agree with Anil that nothing is given up for free. There, you need to make those personal investments in doing so. And I know that um, just yesterday there was a, I was invited to a panel with um, Indian Finnish government where there is a lot of a collaboration that um, I think I want to say six to eight months ago, they announced a collaboration that is occurring, but not much has come about. And so now they're bringing in uh, companies from each uh, each nation and really trying to support that uh, collaboration. So for example, IQM, which is one of the uh, leading quantum computing uh, companies out of Europe, they are you know willing to partner with various different companies from India, which from which we can actually utilize their systems. And they actually, they're utilizing superconducting uh, services as well. So they're in some sense competing against other superconducting uh, architectures like IBM's of the world.